is going on, guys? And welcome back. I hope you are ready to shoot the shit, all right? I'm your host and your, your producer, Jay Elite. I'm here with my co-host, Mike Wheels, Brandon Fit, as you guys remember from episode one. And we have a very, very, very special guest. Um, we are honored to have Jason Green here with us. Constable Jason Green, Coach Jason Green, national level bodybuilder Jason Green, Mean Green, Team Green Machine, DJ Green. How many <laughs> names you got? You got a bunch of names there, I know. I got a few, apparently. Yeah. How you doing, man? Good, man. How are you? Good, good. You still getting your cardio in, as we were just talking about? I'm trying, yeah, I'm trying. I'm working on it. Is, is that something you're just doing on uh, training days, or do you just kind of do it? six days a week seven days a week no i've been doing cardio for the last probably 10 years six days a week just 25 minutes all year long i feel i feel good doing it that's just how i like to start my day ladies and gentlemen take note that's proper work ethic you don't need to be healthy crap right there. yeah it, it, it's your health it's your heart but it's also just stamina it's overall your well-being it's a routine he's committed to and it pays off in every aspect of life that's why the man's so successful and, and it allows you to eat a little more what? As, uh, as, 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 yeah. Seth, as Seth Barossi says, more snacks. More cardio yeah. equals more snacks. <laughs> true, true. So I know um, everybody's got a bunch of questions. Um, we, we were getting tons of questions on the gram. Um, but there was just one thing that I wanted to share with everyone before we get started, just so we can get an idea of where this is about to get going here. Let me try to share <laughs> this up. All right. Now I'm curious to see. Yeah, we. Oh. I got a good idea. This one right here. Maybe I'm a little nervous. Ooh. Do you guys see this? Ah. You gotta make a, yeah, if you can make it bigger. You got to blow it up a little bit. Oh, okay, I think it's just because you guys can't see it, but in the podcast, they'll see it big. Okay. All right, let me see. Yeah, so this is a picture. You guys, tell me a little bit about this picture. Jason, can you see it? I can see it. Okay. What year was that? 2010. 2010. 2010. Wow. Yeah. I know because it was my first OPA show, and I didn't know Jay at the time, but I remember looking at Jay like, I mean, obviously he had years of training on me, but I'm like, man, this guy's just swollen. Like his fucking legs look, made mine look like popsicle sticks. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. Well, you got the angle in this picture, but you were bigger, 100%. What did you place in that show? Uh, I think I was second. Oh, shit. Okay, well, I was like 11, so that's pretty good. I think John Aylo won that show. He won, yeah, because I came second to him in the juniors. It's where I should have just stayed there, but, you know. Yeah, so for those who can't see, if you're listening um, just uh, through the radio version, um, that's a picture from, was it Nationals or CB CBBF? Where is that? London. Yeah, it was, that's what... That's OPA prior to this, way before CPA even started. Okay, right. Yeah, because 2012, I wasn't even bodybuilding at this time. Yeah. Um, my I, wasn't even, was I wasn't even born. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> so if you can't see, there's a picture of Jason Green dead center and Mike Wheels right to his, uh, to his right side um, later down in the line. Well, that must have been the numerical call out to Mike because you belong Absolutely. nowhere near him next to him. Oh, <laughs> I got destroyed in that the open class. They did well in the juniors, and again, I should have just stayed there. That's where I belonged. But I wanted to go with the big fish, and uh, I learned the hard way. But it was good motivation seeing Jay for the first time. You know, you know what? Super, super flat that show. I, I over depleted, and I came in. I came in tight, but I was super flat. The sad part is I was full, and that's what I look like. So <laughs> Mike's got the best transformation picture in the IFBB. I say that all the time. Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> but honestly, you know what? You've actually beat a guy who's beat Mr. Olympia. You know that? Because Mike's Mr. beat Olympias. Brandon Curry. And Bumstead. Yeah, and true. And Bumstead, right? Yeah, and Bumstead, yeah. yeah. So there's a yes. little uh, unclaimed feather there. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I have a question. Uh, I'll say Jason because you guys are both Jay. So Jason, um, were you a cop at that point or like yeah. at what point? Oh, you were. So yeah, were you a cop before bodybuilding or you bodybuild and then you started being a cop? How did that work? No, I was, I was a bodybuilder before I was a police officer. And what age was oh, that okay. at? Uh, I did my first show, I believe, 2000, maybe 2000. I think it was our wow. first show. Way back, oh, so, way back in the day. 
So you've been Holy competing shit. for 20 years then. Wow. Well, I did two shows. I, I won both those shows. I did way back in the day. It was when we had three tiers in the OPA. Uh, yeah. So the Kingston show, won that. And then I did the East Ontario's, won that. Lost in the overalls to Mike Ken- or to Dan Kennedy. But uh, those were my first two shows. But, dude, he looked, he looked pretty good from the pictures I've seen that he posted. Like, he looked good. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, he looked pretty good. Oh yeah, he was he was no joke. The second yeah. time, the second show when I won and I was going out for the overall, I saw that he won. I was like, ah, fuck it. Chug two or three liters of water before the overalls went back out because I knew I knew I had a chance. And then, at what point did you start being like? Uh, did you did you go to college to be a cop, or did you you have post secondary, or how did what did, like? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I did a uh, three year college diploma in behavioral sciences. Okay. And I did uh, a dual degree at Queens with a minor in uh, sociology, or sorry, major in sociology and a minor in health. And you were competing this whole time. You were going. I started competing when I was in Queens. Yes. That's cool. so wow. That's crazy. So you so started you, lifting. Sorry, Brennan, go. No, so I was just wondering, how did you manage like the workload with school and everything while competing and and going through, you know, to be a police officer? Uh, Honestly, I, I missed a lot of classes towards closer to the end of prep. Uh, but they had a thing called Q card where you go on and see the lecture notes. So I kind of mm. self taught myself from that. And uh, works enough, I also worked in the hospitality industry that some people in my class knew what I did. So they would take notes and give me the notes to help me out too as well. So that's I can't, Im- I can't imagine dieting and going to school. That would be like, <laughs> that would be. A it's nightmare. hard. It, it, it's hard, man. It's hard. I can't imagine dieting and going to work. Huh? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess it's the same thing. I guess it's the same thing. The retention load for your brain is very minimal. You're not oh, yeah. retaining much. No, because with like school, it's a lot of memorization, and your brain just oh, yeah. doesn't function properly when you're when you're depleted, right? Dude, so. shit just bounces off your fucking brain. Like it's just it doesn't not as much absorbed. It's not as you just ca- can't. Can't comprehend things properly. So, no. who got you into competing? How did you get into competing? Um, back then, I was I was training for football and track, and uh, someone said, "Hey, you got some good genetics. You ever thought about competing?" And a buddy of mine, Aaron Bailey, I think he works for um, either Allmax or uh, sorry, pure, the company that makes diesel diesel protein. Uh, oh, oh. Um, I know his name. I know what you're talking about, yeah. So I think I think so he was doing uh his first show, a junior show back then. So I went and watched it and that's sort of where I got the bug. And then uh I think two years later, my then coach Rhonda Charisma, who's an IFPB pro, uh talked me into competing and uh, she took a look at me and she said, Yeah, you're doing the show and that's kinda how it happened. <laughs> so how long has that been now since your first show? How many years? Long time it was two thousand. I think my first show was two thousand. Nice. I did Twenty years. Shows. That's crazy. Brandon, How when many... were you born? <laughs> <laughs> I was born in ninety seven. So I would. Oh my god! <laughs> Jason has been competing longer than I've been alive. Yeah, you were sucking up on the city when Jason was cleaning house on stage. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was cleaning house on stage before I was even a thought. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I did the I did the two shows and then I got out of it and. Uh, started boxing and, and stuff like that again and just being more athletic, got hired on the police service. And then I think I was four, four years in and then I uh, was training two other people for shows. And one of the girls I was training, who's now IFB pro, Lee Thexton, she made a comment about it's been so long since I had been comp- I've competed that I don't, I don't understand it anymore, how tough it is. And I said, well, if you win your show, I'll do a show. And she won. So I got back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's when good. I, I mean, you, you relied on the success of your clients to kind of help boost you and to get you back in the game. Oh, for sure, for sure. So I mean, subconsciously, you knew she was going to win because you were training her, so you were ready. You knew she was going to win because you were the coach. So it's, he was probably but, dieting and getting her ready. He was. For he was so <laughs> wait, 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 suddenly so, saying. He was suddenly so, saying he's ready to go back. So what? Up. What? When is this? What? When is this? This is like platinum whippy time then. Now right? we're in two thousand and uh, I think two thousand and nine. Okay. Yeah. So just around in times. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, Crazy. I know that's that's it. I, I I one of the main things too that I didn't get a chance to experience that both of you guys have um, in common and experience with is the CBBF. 
the whole CBBF yeah. to me, when I was coming up in 2012 <laughs> and watching like everybody competed on Facebook, CBBF nationals was everything. That was Huge. like, it was like the Olympia, you know, I, That's right. all I wanted was that jacket. I just wanted that CBBF jacket. To me, that was the Olympia jacket. I'll give you one of mine, Jay. Hey, yeah, yeah. I'm no, sure, now, I'm sure Jay now I want an I Olympia mean. jacket. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah. But Jay, yeah, how so, many... like, so like right in that time period, um, you guys, when you guys were competing, that was pretty much the end of that whole CBBF era right when I got into it. Because when Jay whooped my ass in Provincials, that was my last chance to go to CBBF. And then, like we said, mom and dad split up. Yeah. Well, I mean, with the CBBF, I, I believe that actually went because I think Johnny won the last overall when the CBBF was around before that whole split happened and then CPA came around. I think 2016 or 2017 was the last year of CBBF. Yeah, that was. That like, was it's been only a couple of years since the, um, the CPA has been around. That was when we did Provincials together, Jay, right? 2017? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. How many, sh Jay, um, Jason, do you know how many, uh, like, shows you've done to date? Somewhere around 14 or 15. Yeah. Wow. It's a lot. Up something, there. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, because of – and I always tell people the more shows somebody has under their belt, the more experience they get with themselves – and with, you know, even the clients that they're training that you get more of a, a wisdom and you're able to customize certain things for, for people, which is definitely one of the reasons why, Jay, you're so successful and you understand the diversity of each client being so different and it ranges, you know. Sure. And, um, and, I mean, it's great to have coaches like you in the country, in the CPA, because it, it, it's hard, man. I find, like, nowadays everyone's a coach, you know. But yep. some, some are yep. like yourself and some are like – you should leave them for the Jay Greens. Leave the clients for the Jay Greens or the Amers or the Shans or the, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah, I, I remember. Well, this actually spins into like a whole other whop of Jay Green questions because we got Jay Green, the bodybuilder, which we discussed a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about Jay Green, the coach. You mentioned your first couple clients, Lise, and who was the other one? My very first two were Lise and Marta Bayalaka. Okay. I remember Marta too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, those were like, this was like the Facebook era days, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so how many athletes I, I, over time would you say you've coached altogether? Like just a general. A thousand. E no, I would say, I'd say three or 400 probably. Yeah. <laughs> how many clients Holy would you shit. say you've had at a show at one time? I think at the, the most. most. The most I've had was... 14 or 15, I think. Yeah. And out wow. of those, out of those, how many of them placed? I already know the answer. But 14 or 15. <laughs> <laughs> All of them did. <laughs> Man, if you've ever been to a CPA show or if you've been privileged enough to have been to an OPA show, then you know that Team Green Jacket. You know when you see everybody huddled up backstage. Dude, they got they tights. Got the they got everything. <laughs> they got tights. More than just yeah, a jacket. It's, a, it's monster. And as coming up, um, as I talk to the guys all the time, I got into nutrition, as you know, Jay, before I got into competing. So watching you as a coach, you've always been like uh, one of my mentors to me. Um, looking up when I used to follow around Chris Wong in the gym and I would sit there and just watch you guys chat and shoot the shit like we're doing now for like yeah. half an hour as I like just sip on my pre-workout and, and get ready to go kill it. So um, I'd like to thank you personally because I know if you've motivated me, for sure you've motivated tons of other people. Supplements designed by an IFBB pro, holistic nutritionist and veteran. Our 360 Quality Assurance System ensures you get fully dosed supplements that work. Whether your goal is to build muscle, burn fat, enhance strength, or extend endurance, we've got what you need. This is an army of iron warriors. This is the AG Army. Join us and wage war on your genetics. AGArmy.com Field tested, science proven, advanced genetics. And 
I know you've motivated Sean because I've seen you guys kind of go back head to head with, with well, who's a number lot of their, one. A lot yeah. of their clients, yeah, <laughs> yeah, are like yeah. head to head. So yeah, and it's on tyranny. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's great to see, right? Because the it's athletes know too. Yeah, that they have good competition. Because I was yeah. actually just talking with um a, another former athlete, Franklin, which you also coach amazing athlete and i was mentioning to him like look guy it was your pictures back in the day that made sure i never missed cardio it made sure i never skipped a workout because anytime i felt that way i had your pictures to look at and i'd be like fuck <laughs> this is this is what i'm going up against so I better, yeah so i better, I better <laughs> exactly I better right it. yeah now i got the whole ocean of the IFBB stick his poster up in your room yeah. Stick his Jason, poster up in your room. Nah, right? nah, that ain't happening. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, hey, how many, uh, how many clients have you turned pro? Uh, to date, 16. Wow. So, I mean, in a way, you have made Canadian bodybuilding and you've contributed to, contributed to it in such a large scale. You've Huge. made it more prestige. Huge. You know, and uh, I'm, not just, I'm not just like pumping your tires. It's, it's true because it's the knowledge of the coaches Stop it. <laughs> a, a client is only good as their coach. If they're not getting that necessarily knowledge uh, required to level up, they're not going to be able to. So um, with your wide range of knowledge, you're able to, um, you know, help advance, it, whether it's bikini, physique, uh, figure, bodybuilding, yeah. you know, you're making, that, you're making that transition for them. But do you find, like, you're better with girls or guys? or Because they're so – I find even for myself as a coach, it's, it's, I don't even really like working with girls, to be honest. It's, it's because it's so, it's like a different ball game. It's completely Huge. different. It's totally different it's, ball it's, game. Yeah. I, I would, I would say, if you want to talk about mental toughness and fortitude, the, the women are way easier. They can suffer. Wow. They, they, uh, my guy, my guy uh, clients won't be too happy they say this, but they, <laughs> they, uh, they bitch. Do anything I, say. Like, I, I, I always joke saying, I could put dog food on the floor and say, eat that. And they'd say spoon or fork. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love yeah. it. But um, th th with the women, the hormones and the way their body responds, and they have a whole host of other issues or, or complications that can arise that, you know, men don't seem to have that it, it's a little trickier for sure. But especially with, yeah, yeah like hormones and women have their period and oh, yeah. like one a show you can have a girl that looks great but she gets her period i guess maybe too close to the show and she holds water and it fucks up her physique for sure and, uh, i mean yeah you got to be able to i guess try to divert that or you know uh, be able to make last minute decisions because you don't got to worry about that with guys no no not at all and i always try to um make sure my athletes are good enough to step on stage a week out so there's no real magic to the final week we yeah. can't just cruise in and we tinker a little bit, but there's not a whole lot that changes the final week. It's, I should feel confident that a week out, if they had to step on stage, they could. Is that where the whole mean green thing comes in? Cause you'd be like, listen, a week out, cancel the hotel, cancel the fucking tan. Cause you ain't going on stage. You're fat. Um, <laughs> you look oh like no. Fat. I think, I think the mean, mean coach green comes, uh, because I, I tell it like it is. I'm pretty blunt. Um, I'm not sure oh, wow. if, um, well, that's why. Yeah. That's yeah. Why While you guys were talking, I just wanted to throw up one of the elite level athletes that he turned pro. <laughs> As she's, you're talking yeah, about she's females. clearly a pro. Holy she's crap. Really a pro. Yeah. Wow. She's, from, she's from Norway. That's, uh, Ellen. Burr. Oh. So we started working together and she went on to win a gamut of shows. She won the world juniors initially in Mexico. And then she won, I think Madrid, um, the Arnold's in Madrid. And then the, amateur olympia in uh, london and then she turned pro wow so. yeah she i mean you can see what the she must have been has like several several years of training on her belt because you can see the separation uh you can see the doubt cap you can see well, you know even it looks like it's, a lot of experience yeah, well, yeah. Jay, jay even as you were just mentioning you were sorry and i i hope i didn't interrupt you were talking about hormones and and the differences here but look how dry and hard you brought her in Tell us about how different it is to make a woman look like this versus a man with just with just water and like carbs. Um, you know what? Every every client's different. Like I have some women that 
Ellen was was really easy to make look hard. She she had great genetics, and believe it or not, she's only I think twenty years old here. She's young. Yeah. What? Yeah. yeah. She's young. She, she has that maturity at tw- wow. Holy yeah. shit. Super. And people impressive. say genetics don't matter. Wow. <laughs> That's <laughs> insane, man. Yeah. And then All right, this is where I head out. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, when did she start training when she was like five? I think she was she had a couple of years before she reached out to me. And that was all through social media. She I don't advertise her, I don't have a website. She just reached out to me on uh Instagram. And that's how we started. Clearly you guys you- were a good match. Is that how you find most of your clients or like just referrals, would you say? Like pretty much? Um, a little bit of both. A lot of a lot yeah. of people a lot of my out of continent clients, it's through Instagram or they'll see yeah. them and they'll ask them who who trained you and they'll they'll mention me and then they you know go through my profile and then they'll ask me a few questions and we'll do a consult over over a DM and then that's kind of how we start. Yeah. Well, sure. They see people on your page and like, damn, that's what I want to look like. Who's the mastermind? <laughs> Meaner, greener. I feel like a lot of it, a lot of, a lot of it's just based on the fact that you, you know, you've coached so many successful clients and people see that and, and, you know, want to, want to, want to work with you. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, people want to surround themselves with success and yeah, absolutely. And word, of, word of mouth over time too. I've heard about legendary workouts from Greener, legendary what? programs from Greener that, that you got you got to just follow to a T. And um, well, when you do, that's where that me, me, and Coach Green comes in is a the the training methods. And I tell people right off the bat, don't think I have a magic formula or a magic thrill. You, you're going to work. Be prepared to work. Um, but the work, if you do the work, you put in the work, you get rewarded. Hundred percent. Your physique will show. Um, but also. I call people out and I tell them what it is. And I mentally try to prepare people that you're getting on stage with however many other people in front of a panel of however many judges and an audience to say, Hey, I'm half naked up here. And I think I got the best physique up here. You better be mentally strong that if you don't place well or you don't do well or be able to take criticism. So I start that phase early and I, <laughs> I mentally prepare them because I tell them straight Good. up one, but I also tell them I may be hard on them leading up to the show, but the day of the show, everyone, you can hear me in the audience. I'm their best friend or backstage. I'm, I'm their number one fan, right? Yeah. So. A lot of people can probably respect that honesty too, though, because, uh, you know, a lot of coaches in the industry won't. Uh, they're more yes men than anything else. So a lot of people. Oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah, yeah I, couldn't so a lot of people, I find a lot that a lot. Can... No, 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 no. Go ahead. I find that a lot with looks, Jay. Like, what do you, have you ever run into issues where, you will have a client that um, feels they look great, like feels like they look ready, and um, you just really got to give it to them hard. Oh, for sure. And I've had people where they wanted to compete in a category, and I'm like, listen, you don't belong in that category. Like your physique won't won't be rewarded, but if you switch to this category, we might have a we might have you know some success. You know, for example, Lee Stexon, for example, used to be figured, and I'm like. Well, as soon as Daniel and Bailey come on, come along and, and the physique uh, class started, I said, look at this. This is what, where you belong. And she was like, no way. I'm not giving up my heels. I'm like, no, you seriously need to do it. And then we were at the Arnold's and she was with her boyfriend. I said, there's Daniel and Bailey there. I said, because she, she kept saying she was, Dana was too big. She's not that big. And I said, you're not giving yourself enough credit. Go stand beside her. She just did a show. She got her picture taken with her. And when I showed her the picture, I said, so? And she said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start that. Wow. I made her believe. And then um, she, she ran through the ranks quickly and got her pro card. And then I've also had some girls that is not to sound harsh, but they don't have the physique or the marketability or the, the, the look they want to do bikini. And I'm like, you're not going to do well because it, it's still a beauty pageant for fit people. And not that they're not pretty or they're not, you know, beautiful in their own right. Right. But, they don't fit the mold of what's in at the time or trending at the time. Yes. You probably the specific won't do, look. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, you probably won't do well. However, you know, you do got a physique that'll do well in say figure. Let's try that. You can do bikini, but let's also do figure as well and see where you get rewarded. And that's it's sometimes speak- that's hard to do with somebody, right? Yeah. Speaking of that and the marketability, one of the main things that I noticed about you um, when I was watching you, 
um, earlier in the game, back in this 2012, 2015, you were so much more than just a coach to like these athletes. Um, I know, I know a couple of your athletes and one of them personally is my best friend. You were more like a manager, therapist, best bud, um, the guy that's going to put your tan on if nobody's there. I've seen Jay personally open his pocket and help people get tanned. And I know that's a story that he wouldn't tell personally. And I've seen that myself. And that just kind of goes to show what sets apart um, a lot of these guys. Like you said, Mike, uh, earlier, everyone's a coach. No, right. everyone's not a coach. That's there true. are real coaches. and there 100%. Are yeah, yeah, yeah. Or everyone yeah. claims to be. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. You, you, you yeah, get, no, I totally understand what you were saying. Sudden, but yeah. I'm just, like, really just narrowing him down into into those categories of top five. Top three, I can't even really think of um, a few. Yeah, just a few names, like the ones that we mentioned earlier. It's, it's the yeah. compassion, too, that, you know, you show for your for your clients and just genuinely showing that you care, you know, going above and beyond for them, you know, p- plays the biggest difference, yeah. I think. How do you how do you manage those hats? How do you know when to put on well, let me drop a bomb. How do you know when to put on the boyfriend hat and the coach hat? Let me share that's, another picture here tough. as we go on. Yeah, that's <laughs> tough, man. Um you talking about referring to Catherine, my girlfriend now? Absolutely. Can you see her there? <laughs> Can you guys see that? Crazy. Yeah. 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 I well, mean, Jay, it looks like you're notorious and, and, and known for this crazy conditioning and dryness. Yeah. I feel like that's what a lot of your clients have. I remember even seeing Bree when she won, uh, I think it was Stratford, just, you know, she was bikini, but as dry and sharp as you could be. And uh, you seem to have that formula and hit the nail on the head every time. Well, I always bank on the, especially for the lower level shows, whatever you're lacking in genetics or say muscularity or wherever the division is, if you come in in shape, chances are you're going to get looked at. So I always make sure no matter who they are, they come in in shape. And that's regardless of what category they're in or what level they're at. The big thing is you got to be in shape. Yeah. And then we'll worry about the rest. So that's, that's, I've kind of been, I've been told that before that my athletes always come in in shape or they've got top notch conditioning or whatever. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, to back to Jay's question, um, before we started, you know, I told her there's Jay the coach, Jay the boyfriend, and I can separate the two, but you got to be able to too that, you know, when I turn my coaching hat on, you can't take it personally. You got to realize I'm being a coach, but when it's time to be Jay the boyfriend, I can put that hat back on too. And she embraced it and, you know, she's one of the hardest working athletes I got. Like she's, she's a firefighter. She, she, she can hang with uh, most people. I did a group workout as soon as she joined the team and uh, she kind of led the, led the, led the crew. Like she was top notch. I had him at a track doing sprints and intervals and, wow. you know, uh, in, a, in a weight room as well. And, and she right away, she, she showed me that she's what I look for in an athlete, which is she's got to drive that determination. And, and she belongs. That was only her second show. That picture you saw of her there. And I was a Toronto wow. pro, pro qualifier, and she got second. So wow, wow, good for her. Mind you, leading up to that show was my accident uh, four weeks prior, five weeks prior. So she lost a whole six days of training being at the hospital with her. So okay, I was gonna, I was gonna wait, but no, no, we'll touch on it. No, no, we'll wait, we'll wait. Okay, Just, all right. Well, there's let one more athlete, one more story. You got a, you have an athlete that I know personally, and um, you took him from. I think you should do a show. You look like you should do a show. Come on, buddy. You should do a show to fucking pro. Tell us a little bit about Darnell Williams. Oh, Darnell. I first met Darnell. I was at the gym. I was getting ready for a show and it was a fall show and might've actually been the show we were talking about, uh, Mike. And, uh, Oh yeah. Oh crap. We were beside each other. We were beside each other on the, the treadmill. Where's his waist? Where's his waist, man? Yeah, team no waist at all. <laughs> yeah. He put his shorts on to fall off. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like they're hanging off there. Crazy, yeah, crazy exactly. shape. And uh, I guess we got talking about football of all things. And, and you know, he used to be a sprinter as well. And we got telling war stories about that and about football. And 
Um, he was a wide receiver and I was a running back and we were just kind of going back and forth. And then I asked him, like, have you ever thought about competing? And we kind of all had an open dialogue about that every time we saw each other. And then finally one day I said, I think you should. And then we kind of just took off from there. He agreed and, you know, we, we went from there and, and did, our, did his first show and all the way through the ranks. Um, and we, came, we became really close because of it because we were in the same gym, you know, we we're in the same area. So we went to eat together a lot and, and uh, shoot, shoot the shit. And uh, probably, that's probably who you're referring to. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I became a mentor and stuff. And a funny story, one of the first shows Darnell did, we were taking one, taking one last look at him the week of the show. And uh, he was in another federation doing uh, a, like he had a costume round. And he was a baseball player and he had a baseball bat. And he goes, does this look familiar? And uh, I'm looking at it. And I actually stopped him and his buddies working as a police officer in a car and questioned <laughs> them about carrying a baseball bat. And uh, <laughs> it, was just, it was one of those funny stories. I was like, fuck, that was you? And then I remembered, I'm like, oh, I remember the, the, the That's whole my guy. That's that was my guy. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was good. That's Way my guy. Laugh. I don't know. Uh, so let's let's um let's segue. Fast yeah, forward finish, now. I'll just finish about Darnell. Darnell's one of yeah. the coolest stories when he turned pro. He had, I think, he was a, a runner up in pro qualifiers or. Um, back yeah. In the CBF. He won the CBF nationals. He won um, amateur Olympia in Mexico, and yep. he was second at the Arnolds, and he was always the runner up for the pro card. And for whatever reason, he was always so close. So finally, after the Arnolds. I said to him, I said, listen, buddy, if you want to go somewhere else, I get it. I'm not going to be offended. I know you want to be a pro. Um, do what you got to do. And he looked at me and said, no, man, we're, we're ride or die. We ride or die together. And, you know, that, that showed me he had a lot of faith in me. So then he went on to win the Nationals. He didn't get his pro card there. But he won his class. Ironically, it was the only division they didn't give him two pro cards. But he didn't get his pro card. And then he said he was done for the year. And I think I gave him three weeks. I finally said, you got to do the North Americans. And uh, no, I'm not doing them. Gave him a couple more days. Saw him at the gym. I said, you got to stop focusing on being a pro. And, you know, that, that, that's the only thing, you, only thing that's going to make you happy is if you get your pro card. I said, you got to remember that you're Darnell. You're the guy that when you're showing up at these shows, people are like, oh, fuck, Darnell's here. And, and you're eliciting fear in them. I said, you're that top amateur, right? I said, enjoy being that guy embrace that guy and being the guy that everyone's afraid of and, and always placing. I said, cause once you turn pro, you're in a whole different pool. I said, and once you find the love for the sport again, things will happen. And so I convinced him to do the North Americans. He actually got sick the, the final week. He came and picked me up after work. We got in the car, drove down, had a bunch of laughs on the way down, went to Pittsburgh, looked down the night before the show. He was a little off and because uh, of his being sick. So I said, you need to get some blood moving. I took him to the gym. We did a, a little bit of a, a workout, just nothing, nothing major, but just to get some, some blood going and get them ready to update some nutrients. Took them to eat, said, come see me in the morning. Come and saw, came and saw me at uh, five in the morning, took a look at him, gave him instructions to eat. I said, come see me again. He came and saw me. I said, you're good. I actually, it was 55 people in his class. And I thought, Holy, Holy shit. shit. That is a wow. massive class. This is going to be, he's going to have his hands full. And ironically, that's the show that he got his pro card. And I, I, I can remember being so happy watching him in the prejudging, thinking it's going to happen today. And afterwards, you know, he gave me a big hug when he got off stage. And he was elated. And then we went and got something to eat. We took care of business and drove back to Ontario. And that was the end of it. It was kind of one well, of those when stories. When you're was, knocking at the door, man, you're knocking at the door. And yeah, yeah, you're you pushing the limits. Going. And the judges take note. Like, they see you. Yes. And, you know, the judging is a small circle. So the best the right, persistence, persistence, right? But you could see when he went out on the stage, that was a different Darnell. That was the Darnell that started competing. He was having a good time, regardless of how he placed. He knew he wasn't his best because of being sick. But he showed very well on stage, and he looked like he was having the time of his life up there. And I could just tell him, like, today's going to be his day. That must have been just as rewarding for you when he turned oh, pro. For sure. Because you've been with him that whole time, right? Through everything. What year did he turn pro? Was it 2015 or later? Something like, something like that. 
Because I yeah. think what I got – so when we got our um, – the 2015 or 16 people got their pro cards, uh, there were, like the CP or the OPA at the time had a, a dinner after the gala yes. at which yeah, they gave yeah. everybody bracelets. Yes. And I could have sworn I, I seen him there. Maybe it was with a buddy or maybe he turned pro. I didn't know, but I figured I'd no, ask. No, that, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the reason awesome. why I chose Good that genetics, story yeah. of all was because um, – you know, the camaraderie that you guys have, you know, not a lot of coaches are driving to the show with their, with their athlete. Well, I, try, I, through all the motions. I actually, at the beginning of the year, when it comes time to book my holidays, I ask every one of my athletes that are with me what shows are going to do. And I strategically use my holiday time to make sure I'm off to be able to go to as many shows as I can so that I can be there with my athletes. Just, or, you know, I'm notorious for work, working until 4 a.m., getting off or 7 a.m. and driving straight to the show or the venue. Insane. Hours to be there wow. for the, my athletes all day. And that's – You're a robot, man. I don't even know how you're <laughs> able to juggle both. Like, because it, when you have so many clients, it's not like you need to think and you need to, you know, use like, okay, how is this athlete? Like, you kind of got to even go over their history sometimes, see how they respond, especially sure. during prep. So, it's a, like you got your, hand, you, your, your hands full. And I find a lot of people struggle with just training – and and having a job and you're training shift work and uh, you're training working shift work and you know you got all your clients and you know you're still able to have a functional relationship which, which rattles my mind because that's, <laughs> wow. that's, that's the biggest <laughs> that's the biggest win honestly that's if right. you ask any bodybuilder any guy that's the biggest win of it all bro i'm happy yeah. for you guys man i really yeah. am yeah it's amazing yeah. she's solid we know it's that. an awesome story so I, I wanted to ask one question uh for jason before we get into the actual questions yeah because um, there are questions <laughs> yeah we actually have like a full list of questions but i wanted to ask a personal question that's like um like what's next for you like do you plan on c continuing to compete yourself or do you plan on now just putting most of your focus on coaching uh and your career obviously uh I, I, I still foc I'm focusing on my career, but I, I still have a love for the sport. I still train. I still, you know, want to make improvements to my physique. Uh, the last two times I've, I've competed, I've struggled through injuries and I had a, a bunch of issues the last time. Um, I still got some more in the tank. I'm going to do a couple more shows, um, uh, potentially later this year, or maybe depending on what happens or next year, it all depends on what's going on with work and what's going on with this whole COVID-19 stuff. And, and uh, I'm just kind of – I'm on cruise control right now, just trying to better my physique. All right, so let's talk about oh, a little cool. bit of um, what what halted you from competing. I'm just going to share a, um, another another bomb on us. Um, not the most pleasant one, but we have to go through this story. Can you guys see in here? It's here now. So just after 5 oh, o'clock yeah, this morning at uh, Garden Street and Roslyn Road, uh, we uh, responded for a serious collision at that intersection. Uh, we responded and found a, a two-vehicle collision involving uh, a black Honda Civic. Uh, that uh, driver from that vehicle was taken to a trauma center with uh, serious uh, injuries. Uh, I was told that he is now stable, um, but he uh, suffered some uh, life-threatening injuries. Uh, the other driver of the other vehicle suffered uh, non-life-threatening injuries. He was taken to a local hospital, and right now our Traffic Services Bureau our collision investigators are doing a full reconstruction of that collision scene and uh, anticipating to get some more information as to exactly what happened and we'll be looking at the direction of travel of both vehicles and uh, hopefully we'll have more information as they finish that investigation. So Jay, I really hate to, to bring you through and bring you back to this, but um, we really got to hear it from, from your perspective. How are you doing? And um, Tell us, tell us what, what it was like. Like, what, the, what was the story like from your perspective? Um, that was, uh, it would have been May 1st. Just a year ago now. A year ago, just, yeah, I just had my year anniversary. Um, I was driving home at like uh, four in the morning. I went to the grocery store, was coming back, and uh, I ended up going northbound on a street, on Garden Street, and coming up to an intersection. And I remember seeing two police cars up in front of me, thinking, oh, they must be getting off shift. And next thing I know, I woke up in uh, Sunnybrook in the ICU, uh, intubated, tied to the bed, and uh, no clue what had happened. And then um, 
but I knew I was a mess. And anytime you ask any police officer, there's two in Ontario, there's two places you don't want to go St. Mike's or, or, or Sunnybrook. Cause you know, if you're not going there, you're not, if you go there, you're not coming back or you're not coming back the same. So I knew I was in a bad spot and uh, people filled me in uh, that uh, I was in a bad car accident. I was in medically induced coma, uh, cool. st- wow. suffered uh, brain injury, broken jaw, a lot of uh, damage to my left leg. And uh, can there. you even believe we're sitting here talking to this guy right now? I know. Insane. Yeah, like, you know, I was there for six days and uh, I'm, I'm petrified of hospitals for starters. But same. <laughs> that's where my girlfriend, you know, she, her, her stock value climbed through the roof after that. <laughs> we'd, only been, we'd only been dating five months and she never left my side. At that hospital, she like wow. to she was crawling in bed with me, and uh, yeah. that's priceless. I was left to keep her. Oh yeah, I was left talking like a uh, a drunk five year old, and <laughs> that must have been hard to see for her. Oh, for uh, for sure. And I, I mean, yeah. I couldn't talk right. I, I couldn't walk. And I remember all my coworkers coming in one day. That was the one thing too. I had a lot of visitors, a lot of people that came and made that time bearable, and and kind of kept me occupied. But I remember going to the washroom one day with all my coworkers there and um, kind of stumbling into the wall. And and I had a moment of clarity thinking to myself, is this what I am now? Is is, is Jay Green, the weightlifter, gone? Is the bodybuilder gone? Jay Green, the police officer, gone? Is is, is this what I am now? I'm going to be, you know, how someone's going to have to look after me for, for the rest of my life. And, and uh Fuck, I remember hard. telling myself not not to cry because my coworkers are there, were there and to keep a strong face and you know I think it was at that that moment that I was like fuck that this is not going to be me this is not what's going to happen but my coworkers will tell you some of them come back to work saying he's never coming back but he's not right and there was some worry there was some worry that there was permanent brain damage etc but you know, while I was there, I, you know, my, I was on my phone, moments clear, I was doing check-ins with my clients. <laughs> <laughs> the dedication level is yeah. next, is, is and next then, level with you, man. So, wow, that's unbelievable. The moments of clarity, I, I assembled my own rehab team for when I got out, uh, even a cognitive guy. Uh, and then two days after getting released from the hospital, when they told me, you know, my brain bleed, I had it all over instead of localized. So they didn't oh, have shit. to, uh, they didn't have to do any pressure relieving techniques to, uh, there was no pressure on my brain that way, but that's why I had a, a whole bunch of symptoms because it was all over, affecting a large area of my brain. Um, but two days out, or two days after getting out of the hospital, they said they weren't going to wire my jaw shut, and my leg was all soft tissue damage based on the MRIs and the CT scans they did. So, of course, me at the, at the hospital, I said, well, when can I go back to the gym? And they, First question you ask. And they looked at me <laughs> and they said, Oh no! This motherfucker's crazy. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you got to sit in a dark room and, and no light and this and that. And I had a, uh, some research on my phone. And I showed them. I said, "That's old school thinking." I said, "You actually want me to move some of this this uh, blood around and have it reabsorb?" I said, "I'm not going to go increase my intracranial pressure. I'm not going to be doing squats or deadlifts." I said, "But I just want to know I'm not going to go to the gym and hurt myself." You know. And they were like, "Well, you know, you can do body weight stuff, but that's it." And uh, they, I think they realized I kind of had some knowledge. So we left and two days after the gym, I <laughs> looked at Catherine and I said, or after the hospital, I said, take me to the gym. And she's like, you're not going to the gym. I said, you're either going to drive me and I probably shouldn't drive or I'm going to drive myself. <laughs> so, I said, you got a show to prep. I'm not, I'm not doing the show. I said, you're four weeks out now and you've lost a week because of me. You're doing the show. And we went to the, we went to the gym and she even said that once I got in there, I started working out. She looked over at me and she said, this stubborn fucker's going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> the first time she thought that, she was like, this guy's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but Jay, the thing is, man, a lot of people, let's say, who got in that accident, who aren't Jay Green, because of mental, they're not there mentally. They're not, they don't have that hunger and that tenacity. Dedication. Yeah. That dedication and perseverance. They might have been almost in a vegetable state because your mind is so strong and you're able to force yourself you start moving the gears and you naturally start you know your body's kind of almost forced to recover faster because you're moving in that direction and the size must have helped as well the muscle physically they told me that because i 
I didn't have my seatbelt on, a, a stupid error on my part, which I always wear now because like, I was just going down the street and back. Um, when I rocketed into the windshield and where the rear view mirror was, they said I would have broke my neck if I wasn't as muscular as I was. I would have broke my neck and I would have probably been either dead or paralyzed the quadrupedal paraplegic. So, so sorry, Jay, let's backtrack for a sec. Uh, Jason, what happened? You were at the light. I know I was coming up to the intersection. Okay. I don't, I don't remember the collision at all. And I got T-boned. From so he would have ran through, he would have ran through a red light then, right? The guy who was turning. Yeah. The, the buddy was he, who was, was he drunk or what the fuck? No, no, like, no, no. I think it was, it was an older guy is what I read. He was, was like, a, it was an older gentleman. He was an older gentleman. Yeah. Well, you know, since we're on here and we're being honest, I actually was responsible for the collision. I ran a red light. It was oh, okay. one of those moments where I'm assuming I was either looking further ahead at the cruisers and at the next set of lights and missed my vision wasn't picking up what was going on in this interst- this That interst- happens, yeah. Or gotcha. because I'd worked the night before and I was in court during the day that um, I was driving, you know, where you, you go, oh, shit, that was a stop sign. Or, oh, I just right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I we've all, we've all, we've all done it. We've all done it. I never had that moment to say, oh, shit, because as soon as I went through, I got hit. Yeah. Fuck. I don't, I don't, I don't remember it, so. You don't remember them, like, did, did you see your car afterwards? You don't have any recollection? I, I, saw, saw, pictures, the I saw pictures on the car uh, on Facebook. I, like, can't remember when Catherine put them up. But right away, I, like, just stopped everything. And like, my heart just dropped. I was like, oh, my God. Did they have to use the jaws of life to get you out of that thing? Or, like, how... What? Did they, no, I was, did they do that? I talked to the first officer that was on scene. Um, I was head first in the uh, footwell of the passenger seat and upside right when they found Holy out. shit. So, wow. And you're a big man, dude, man. You're, so you're, over, you're a soldier, bro. You're yeah, back yeah. on your feet, back in the gym. Like talking to you this whole time, I, I haven't heard any kind of like complaining verbal or, or no, not complaining, but like actual physical damage. Like ninety nine percent of people. You've done really would well dead. with your recovery, man. This is like a a total testament to like mind over matter, and just like making a decision to fucking get it done. Oh, I was I was I was terrified. Like I remember, you know, going in even though my brain wasn't working right. Um, my internal thoughts, I could, I could process them. And I remember going for my MRI and my CT scans. I went for two of them. And when I went for the second set, I'm thinking, what if they find something they're not looking for? You know, what if there's something else wrong with me that they find vicariously by looking at what's happened or what we know has happened? Or, you know, I didn't know if I was going to go back to work. Um, I was terrified. And even before, even during my recovery process, when, I was going to see the cognitive therapist. Um, I would get up, go do my cardio, go get a coffee so I was alert. And I wanted to make, it was almost like I wanted to go pass the exam. So when I didn't sit with him and he <laughs> the test in front of me, I'd be like, how did I do? Because I need to know that I was progressing. Yeah, I remember, yeah. I think I was, I was four weeks with him and he finally just went, closed his books up and he goes, listen, man, I got nothing else for you. He goes, you're good. He goes, if wow. I didn't think you were good, he goes, I would get somebody else or get a second opinion. He's like, you're going to be just fine. And I remember that was such a relief um, mentally for me that I was like, okay, here we go. But I had, I, I mean, I, I went back to work modified, uh, modified duties 10 days later after the accident. And then after, after getting out of the hospital, sorry. And then four, it was four weeks to the day of getting out of the hospital. I was back to work full duties. So I passed my provincial, provincial recall, my judgmental training, my firearms training. And so I got, I went to my okay. boss. Okay. Okay. This brings up, okay. We, we do have questions on the Instagram okay. Okay. from your fans that we yeah. got to have to get to, sure. but the, but I, there are just a couple more that I want to close off. You're so passionate. What's, what's, what's your main passion? What's, what's more, what are you more passionate about? I guess policing or coaching? Or competing. Ooh, good question. Because everything you do, it seems like you're wholehearted in it. Like I know a lot of people, they I don't I'm not gonna speak for anyone, but I know a lot of people they probably feel when they go to work, they're just going to work. I yeah, know right. you personally and I know you love your job. Um 
I would think because you spend, you know, and I tell everybody this when they're asking, you know, what I do for a living, why I chose anything, you know, you spend so much time at work, you better make sure you love what you do because it's going to affect every other aspect of your life when you're not at work. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I truly do love my job. And I remember after my accident, I remember driving in the car with Catherine and seeing an officer go by in the cruiser and thinking that that's what I do. And I had that same desire of wanting to be a cop and the police were, you know, superheroes and that's what I wanted to do. And I was like, I better, I better go back to that. I'm going to go back to that. And I still had that passion in me. So I would say it's hard to pick because I love, I love training people. I love that. Uh, I love work. Um, and then I, I love training. So there's not really, there's not really, one doesn't really weigh the other. I mean, policing's my, my thing and I will always train. And as long as, you know, I'm relevant, I'll, I'll train people too. So it's not really, I don't have one that I'm like, okay, this is what I'm super passionate about. Probably yeah. I would say work is, is my main priority and my training is my side gig. That's why I limit it to like 30 people a year. Oh, so there is a limit. Okay. You know what? That, okay. Let's get into the questions. Cause I did see someone did have a question of, about that. Um, so let's get, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to ask, like, it's crazy because so many people, you know, have their personal training thing as their main gig. Mm -hmm. That's their main source of income. And it's all they do because they don't have time for anything else. Yep. It's like, it's a time thing. You got 15 clients, 20 clients, and then you're training and then you're meal prepping and you got to do groceries and you got to like live a life outside of that. It's like, there's no time. How in the hell do you do it? Like, are you at work? And then if you have some time, you're checking up on clients because um, I find it hard with like eight clients and that's all I do. So I don't know how you do it. Um, the good thing about policing is it teaches you how to time manage. And long before, right before I was a police officer, when I was going to university, I was working three jobs. I was volunteering. I was still training. So I learned to time manage at, a, at, a, at an early age. And it continues with policing because you have courts and you have cases that you got to prepare and you have all kinds of stuff you have to do. Um, so I just time manage. Like when my day's off, my girlfriend will tell you, like I usually allow on my four days off, one day is strictly for us to hang out and have a date night. Um, or it's just clutch whatever we want to yeah. do if we want to just make dinner together or work to dinner or whatever um, and then any other time you know because she goes to bed early I'm usually up till two or three in the morning my clients will tell you sometimes they'll get a text at four in the morning saying you got mail or check your mail when I've done their completed their check-ins or done their program switchovers or their diet switchovers um, and that's kind of how I do it and you know Sometimes the first thing I do when I wake up is I sit at the end of my bed and because I have an open policy on text messages, I'm responding to text messages for my clients before I get up and do anything. So yeah, good for you. Kind of, good, kind for of you how I good for you. Open policy. Um, as in all your clients can text you, they all have your number. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that sort of also creates that, like that brotherhood and that, you know, mentorship that you're able to give your clients. Cause I feel it's a little bit harder if you only limit it to emails and nothing against coaches sure. who have that. I totally get it, but yeah. I feel it's more intimate when they're able to text you and, yeah. you know, get you on that personal level. Especially Personal's when true. there's like little things here and there. When I, that was one of the things that I found was a big difference when I brought it in. And you know you, what? You can tell when a, when a client's clicking and they, they feel good and they're happy when they're sending you not scheduled photos of what they, what they saw or what they look like or the pump they got in the gym, or whatever. And you kind of embrace that as a coach. Cause you feel, you feel the same kind of pride for them that, you know, okay, they're, they're realizing what they want or they're getting what they want and they're happy. So you're happy. And that's kind of, that's yeah. kind of how it works too. Right. Yeah. I had been with a coach before and they had told me that I sent them too much pictures. I stopped See, working with them. Yeah. <laughs> I stopped working but a, with a lot them. of coaches, man, they just, <laughs> a, a lot of coaches I find they just want to deal with the, like, I just want to see you on check-ins. I don't give a shit about your pumps. You can take me on Instagram, but kind of like, just leave me alone. And I hate that too, because I like to have, it is a relationship, whether you want to, sure. you know, uh, believe it or not, having a coach sure. is like, it's like finding the right girl almost. Yeah. And yeah. it's a big deal. <laughs> like true, I've though. had coaches for Makes a long sense. time and, it's, it's just a big deal that you have yeah, that connection. 
Yeah. And then, it, again, it's, it's Brendan's bedtime. He always goes for or a quick nap. Yeah, it's his bathroom break, all right? So we'll, we'll do a commercial right here and just put it in his square. <laughs> we'll leave it running. <laughs> all right, okay, all fine, all right. Um, Jay, we, we can shoot the shit for forever, and I don't want to hold you up all day, all right? So let's get into, let's get into some of these questions. We got a question from baby biceps underscore three three three. Mike, this is on your page. <laughs> okay. All the questions are there. Strict meal plans versus if it fits your macros, pros and cons of both. What do you do as a coach? Um, I tend to think the more variables I'm in control of, the more I'm in control of the outcome. And I find there's a misconception of that. If it fits your macros, a lot of people think it's an excuse to eat junk food. So if you're if you're getting your you know your protein calories from a shit food or your carbs from a shit food, and you're gumming them all up into one meal or whatever, you know Ben Pukowski did a great a great uh, YouTube video on this that kind of sums it up, saying that there's certain things that you don't want to put in your body when you're trying to get the best out of your body, right? So if it fits your macros. I might leave a little bit of uh, leeway in the off season for that. Like where I'll give them parameters around a certain meal to choose things. I usually do it one day. I say, here's your free day. Here's what I expect. Pick your meals, but the rest of it, I'm in control. And then when it comes to prep, I want to be in control of everything. And uh, I would say that's one of the, the pitfalls of it. And I would say the, and it, of course, inflammation, a lot of the foods cause inflammation. Uh, and that's one of the things I ask in the questionnaire. Is there any foods that you're allergic to or, they don't agree with your system, you know, if you've had a food sensitivity test done and if they haven't, I ask them to get one done um, so that I can, I can, can control their diet to get them in the, you know, get their body firing and working at the best of its ability. And then we all know that if you feed, you feed your body, right, you get the most out of your output and you get the most of your output, output you're going to get the most out of your responses and, and, and your development. Right. So. Absolutely. Just in that just your tail, tail. What were you saying? I said, especially when it comes to fat loss too, right? Like, yeah. If you're not, if you're not controlling other hormones, like a lot of people don't control hormones, like leptin, ghrelin, um, insulin, hormones. And shit like that, right? You're, you're, you're not going to get what where you should be if you can control those with, which a lot of them are controlled by food and what you eat. You're going to get a better outcome. So, How do you feel about um, dairy and, and people that get protein from dairy? Um, the protein from dairy is okay. Like you mean like whey? No, like cheese. Greek I, I have like Greek I have yogurt. I have clients that yeah they want to they want to do everything they see Greg Doucet do, and it's like Greek yogurt and Pop cottage corn. cheese and all this stuff, and then Fresh like dollars. half their protein is from cheese, and I'm like I don't know if Jay would allow this. Uh, you know, in the off season, usually when they consult me, I'll say yeah you can do this, and I. I kind of, I'm also a big believer on nutrient timing. So yeah, if you want to have that, have that with this meal or have it here in the day, um, then I'll allow it. But during the prep, you know, usually fruit goes, uh, eventually fruit will go, but not, not initially, but no dairy, no fruit. I try to control all those things. And I mean, everyone knows, you know, when it comes to bodybuilding or any sort of sport of physical culture, you have your staple foods. You know, you can, you can construct meals and make them taste better and more palatable, but you have your staple foods that unless Absolutely. you're a vegetarian or, or a diabetic or whatever, that kind of everybody eats and, and then, you know, you control your macros within those meals and that's kind of how I do it. And there's, there's other variables like, you know, carb timing or indulating. And I'm sure it's different from each client, right? Yes. And that's, yeah. that's what it is. It depends on the client, right? You got to get to whatever. You got to do an individualized approach with each person, right? Yeah. Well, cause I know like, <laughs> let's say if I was Jay's client, I can't have dairy. I have IBS. So like, you know, um, Jay might be able to, Jay, you get away with way more eating than me. Like, yeah, Jay, <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I look at Jay and my stomach starts rolling over. Yo, me, that's you know? probably it's, what I she's watch, doing. She's probably I watching watch my stories Instagram. and like, yo, let me put a little cheese on here. Yeah. I watch his Instagram <laughs> stories and I gain 10 pounds. Yeah. yeah. Watching yeah. his Instagram stories. Yo, I started prep though. So they're going to get real boring real quick. <laughs> I don't buy it. I don't believe it at all. <laughs> he had he 
story. Had Chinese, he had Chinese food and, and whatever else you had. And, I was, and I'm texting you, getting ready to, to, you know, train in your basement and whatnot. And then I don't get a reply. I'm like, oh, he definitely is in a food coma right now. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, as long as you go to the gym when you wake up, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dude, you train at one a.m. That one time I used to go around like like regularly to three sixty-five. I know at one a.m. I was trying to keep up with you with that, but it, it never worked for That's me. But so with the work late. from home, yeah, the work from home thing though has changed home. everything. Yeah, because absolutely. then it's like I have to get up for work, but I'm just going downstairs. It's not like I'm yeah, 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 yeah. It changes your availability and everything yeah. for sure, for yeah. sure. Yeah, and especially when you're training in your basement. Yeah, I yes, mean, we get exactly. crazy workouts down there, man. <laughs> All right, Jay, I got another one Next for question. you. From um, Freaks Customs. Uh, he, You know, we used to train at uh, Platt together. Hit or steady state cardio, which do you prefer for your clients? I'm, I'm curious on this one. Um, again, when it comes to cardio, there's, you know, the argument for fastest state versus post-workout versus whatever. Um, I would say if you're going to do hit, if you've worked out hard enough, it's pretty hard to do true hit post-workout. You shouldn't have that much energy left if you train the way you Agreed. should during your training. So I would say that if you're going to do a post-workout cardio, you would limit it to steady state. Um, do I believe hit has its place? In, in hit and intervals, a lot of people mistake interval training for hit training. You know, true hit training is like those 10 second full speed bursts, you know, followed by a short duration off and, and, and like it lasts maybe 10, 20, maybe 20 minutes max. But um, interval training is different. If someone's going 25 minutes, doing a minute intervals, two minutes, uh, you know, at, at a regular pace, that's interval training. And I think both have their place, especially, you know, if it's fastest state, and I believe in fastest state, um, to speed up Likewise. Your metabolism for the rest of the day. Um, it primes your body ready for nutrient uptake at that moment and starts your day properly. So I think they both have their place, but, and it also depends on the client. Some clients, yeah. you know, it, you know, depends on where their adrenals are. Um, you know, do they have, do they have adrenal fatigue or have, have they been burning out show to show or are they the, client, the kind of client that, um, you know, they, they don't have the capacity to do interval training or hit training yet because they're new. Um, but the aerobic capacity. So it just depends, right? So it's all depends on the client and what I kind of play around with it for all of them, but my preference would be, you know, interval and hit for the morning. And then as it gets longer, if, if we're not getting what we need to get done accomplishing, I'll do the first bout of the first section of that cardio, you know, say 25 minutes with hit or interval and then move into steady state for the rest of the duration, because now you've released the fat from the mitochondria and now you're going to burn it versus whatever you don't burn or whatever is there, it's going to just go back to the fat cells. Right. Would just a tail on the end of that question, do you find steady state versus hit different from men to women? Um, or more genetically based? I think it's genetically based. Uh, it all, again, it all varies on the client because some clients, they don't need a lot of cardio or, you know, you can't, do those interval things because they will lose muscle or they can't do fast as they because they will lose I, I wither away man so i mean for me, yeah, me i can't do yeah yeah so it, again it all depends on the client and and their their genetic makeup and how they respond and sometimes i'll have a plan and if i look at the check-in pictures and look at the data that they're sending me i'm like whoa jay would you, would you say that better genetics means has to work less or would you say better genetics means i can work you harder and that also depends on the mental uh capacity how them. far you could push them right so yeah some clients have great genetics but they're lazy and i've had those clients that they just they've got all the genetics in the world but they don't want to work and i feel like because it's been given to them a lot easier they don't feel they have to push exactly you know? i have some clients that have genetic gifts and they're all gung ho to bring them out and to, to to bring up whatever they can and to do the best they can with their genetics. And you can push them. You know, I use that dog food analogy. They'll do it, right? It's, it's spoon or fork. <laughs> Buddy, yeah. if if you got no, it here, man, you'll do whatever. Our yep. first show we did together that was Brandon Spoon or Fork. Yeah, and and he came in fucking just 
Yeah, that's the formula. You have yeah. to. Yeah. You have to. Like, I'm working with Jose Raymond now, and you know me, Jay. I'm the most stubborn person in the world. And actually, I, I have to commend you and thank you, because the first time that we were ever talking about working together, you looked at me and you said, well, why? What do you need? And it really made me drive that question, like, yeah, what the fuck do I need? I need to just work. I need to do the work. Yeah. Um, but even now, working with someone like Jose, who's completely opposite to the way I do things, I just got to just do what he wants me to do and just follow. It's a different, it's a different dynamic for happens. sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See what yep. happens. All right. I got another question from, from Merham. From Mer- oh, I can't do this. I, I might on, have to edit this. I'll, 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 I'll read yeah. your right. questions out next time. Okay, no, it's just the names, all right? Okay, so this is, she's got a long question, and there's like a two parts questions. It's um, Merahim, 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 Merahim Man. You, you don't got to nail the name, just nail the, the question. I'm going to put it up here, right in the <laughs> dot, and I apologize, Miss Lady. I did not mean to butcher your IG like that. Just please put caps lock or something. Make it a little easier to understand. All right. Okay, Jason, as a busy coach, there's always a waiting list to get on team, Team Green. Some athletes come to your team. Some athletes may leave. What's the reason behind why you're so selective of who comes back on and who goes and how many do you take on? And are you available? Do you have any availability now? Okay, so I might have to get you to break that down again for, for me. Yeah, I'm so already... let's start with the first part. Why the waiting list? Well, you kind of already mentioned. because Yeah, so I, only, I can only take so many on because policing is my priority. So yeah. to be fair and give my clients what they deserve. Yes, I can only, I, can, I can only take on so many, right? I could take on some of these huge numbers like other coaches. And give them half our service, but that it's ain't quality good. over quantity, right? Exactly. Quality always over quantity. Like you want to make sure that you, okay. the more Second, clients you take on, it feel like it sacrifices the quality. Yeah, of course. Second part. Can anybody who leaves team green come back? It depends on why they're leaving. If, if they, you know, some people, they want to go a different route. Um, some people life gets in the way and they got to leave. For those people that life, life gets in the way, like, that they've got to do something else. Like, I have one that she left to have children. She's come back saying she wants to, to compete again or at least get her body back. Sure, I bring her back. There's, there's no reason. But when somebody leaves to go try something else, sometimes them, I'll, those I'll bring them back to. But after training with someone or working with someone, I get a good feel as to who they are and what they are as a client and do they fit what I expect of an athlete and that's what i expect i I expect them to treat this like they're athletes not weekend warriors and they just want to get on stage for a bucket (laughs) and if they don't fit that mold and we you know because the client coach relationship there there is a dynamic there and if you have a conflict of personalities it's not going to work anyway so if i feel there's a conflict of personalities or my style versus what they want to do then no i don't bring them back yeah i think you answered it yeah that's fair enough yeah was there another part to that question or no? It's like well, a three-part question, I think. It, it was pretty dragged on, but I, I kind of yeah. summed, it, summed it up. Um, I don't know who this person is. Maybe they were trying to get back on Team Green themselves. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> recognize the name. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, well, well in, I, know in a lot of people, I know a lot of people is very sought after, so it's not, it's not a surprise question. So a big question. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, Jay, a big question that I noticed that this person asked was, do you currently have any availability? Yeah, I just asked. Oh, yeah, that was the oh, last part of the you, question. Did you get that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, te- I'm technically full, but I do have some wiggle room to take on a few more people because of this whole COVID-19 stuff. A lot of people won't be ready to compete. So they're going to be, you know, kind of in a maintenance phase or they've chosen that they're not going to compete for this year. And when someone's in prep, they, they require a little more attention. So there is there is some wiggle room for taking on a few more clients. Yes. So this individual could just DM you on your uh, on yeah, your that's IG. Yes, sir. Right, it, you're, you're already here first. Is you're that the best first. way to reach you um, for coaching? Yeah. Okay. yeah, slide right in there. Slide yeah. in the DMs. Slide in the DMs. Just, yeah. just slide right in. Yeah, okay. It's an open phone policy. Yeah. All right. Um. So we have a question from Neil. What's the process going? 
what's the process like going from training non-pros to training pro athletes? That's a good one. If, if I've started with them as an amateur and worked with them up through the pro ranks, um, again, it, it's, it's all about the athlete themselves and making them better than they were the last show. So <laughs> what I, what they can put on stage is, is, is based on what they're capable of putting on stage. It has nothing to do with anybody else. It's not like, oh, now they're pros, so now we got to do this. It's, okay, you've now gone up a tier, you've gone up a level, we got to make you even better. Yeah. And it, the, whole, the whole process, the whole goal is every show, make them even better. So as long as you're making them better, because even when they can become pro, you might, not, you might not do well your first couple shows, or you might do great, but you always want to do better. You're only as good as your last show. So you want to make sure you're better than that last show the next time you step on stage. So that's all the goal is, you know, go back to the drawing board, reass reassess, look at the weaknesses, and then adjust and, and go back to work. I think one of the main things is, and having have gone through this myself, would be looking at, directly in the mirror and seeing, look, no bullshit. What the fuck could I do more? And really step up your work ethic. Just even little things from what time you wake up in the morning, from what time you're training to, you know, anything. Like Jay could give it on paper, but the client knows to what extent they're following it and how much. Are they cutting cardio five minutes short? Are they not failing on every set? You know, little things like that at the end will add up big time. I think routine opinion. is the most important thing. Just being yeah, in that sure. consist consistent routine every it's single day. It's everything, man. It's having that mind, that hungry mindset that you're going to stop at nothing. Absolutely. You know, and having someone who's going to push you like Jay is key because not all coaches are ride or die like that. So that's, mm -hmm. that's big to look for in a coach for sure. Is, is, did you find an influx of um, coaching athletes once your, your first athlete went pro? Um, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that. Like, cause well, maybe now, but back then it wasn't like people would want to do a show and it was like, oh, I want to go pro. It was okay. I want to do a show. And I want to do well. And I'm the best. Right. Speak. Maybe nowadays, I mean, we've all been inundated with those people that message you saying, I want to turn pro in a year. I want to turn pro, you know, hold, hold on. <laughs> yeah go back to sleep and keep dreaming is what you gotta tell them <laughs> and i try to explain to people like i'd be like me right now at my age going well i'm gonna go and learn how to skate you know with the chair and everything and then i'm gonna go try it because i want to be a pro hockey player like it's absurd yeah. so there's there's some things that have to there's a process and you know there's certain people that are gifted that will get there, there's a prestige to being a pro and if that's what the prestige is, not everybody's meant to be a pro. And that's okay, too. But there's also the people who are deserving of being a pro will be a pro. Of course. Makes sense. Uh, Mike, you still? Okay. We had a little switch there. Sorry, I got a, I got a call there. I had to yeah, just hang up. Right. Um, I got another question here. Um, Jay, do you think being a bodybuilder helped you at all in being a cop? No, I don't think it had any any relevance at all, to be honest. Um, uh, no, not like in getting the job, but in like your day to day. Um, I would say, in some instances, you or know, maybe more being in shape, not necessarily like like, like I feel builder. like I feel like people wouldn't try you. I was just as, say, as so much. If you look the way you do, people aren't going to test you as much as if they were to test Wait, somebody who... I didn't want to like, say that just like that. Like, ain't everybody out here Coleman, testing yeah. cops. Who's out here <laughs> testing cops? People do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it depends on the call because there's certain calls you go to where they'll lie you up and they'll respect you. I find especially guys that have, you know, been in the system and have, you know, especially the older guys that have been to prison or, or the guys that... Um, train themselves they look at you and they can tell that you train and they respect that and they it, they think mm, you know not today I'm, this is the wrong guy yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that's what, I, that's, what or, I, that's what i'm saying that's what i figured but right? you also have the guys that go well this guy he thinks he's a hero he thinks he's jacked or he thinks he's right a right i want a piece of him that's, that's the cop i want to take on. well well i went to school to be a cop and i don't know if you know some of the names that i'm gonna throw out here but mark armstrong um he works for toronto um he um he's like six 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 seven he's probably like 300 pounds 
I was more intimidated of uh, one of my profs named Amy, who was like four foot eleven and like a hundred pounds. <laughs> I was more scared of her than I was of him. So I don't know. I guess it's individualized too. I feel like. For sure, sure. It, it also it's again it's every call you go to is different. You know the dynamics different, and it's there's a it's communication, right? So it depends on. Sometimes you show up, you don't have time to react. Sometimes it's it's people are bouncing off of what you're giving them. So if you come off like a dick, you're going to get a dick back. If you come across across as a nice guy and you give them some leeway, you know, you, you catch people off guard because they're expecting you to show up and be totally authoritative and, and, and you know, dictatorish, and, and you're going to tell them exactly what it is. There's some people that need that, but then there's some people that you – you can have that conversation and you know and usually when you anticipate it's going to go that route that it's going to go sideways that's not going to be good and you're waiting for backup or whatever you you tend to take that that less intrusive approach and wait for the guys to show up because there's a lot of a lot of stake too right when it does go sideways there's a lot of bad things that can happen not only just your safety their safety but the legal ramifications afterwards too right Right. And you have like a, you have like a gut feeling when you first get to a call like this is gonna be sometimes. a disaster. Yeah, like a gut feeling of when you know shit could go down. Sometimes, for sure. Yeah. Does that help you at all? Like, um, I would imagine it would, but I'm gonna ask you anyway. All of these interactions with all of these different numbers of people, I would imagine you learn so many different personalities. Does that help you in coaching? Um, or vice versa. It'll help you with some conflict resolution skills for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and there are some conflicts that you come across with clients, as you probably know. So, yes, uh, and same thing. There's also times with clients where you got to be direct and you've got to kind of drop the hammer and say, "This is how it is." Yeah. Say, mm -hmm. follow the plan, or I'll arrest you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> or even worse than being arrested, I'll make your ass do two hours of cardio in the morning. Yeah. Class, so. <laughs> to be honest <laughs> oh man all right we got like lots of questions you got a lot of a lot of love here online and that's one thing one reason why we had to have you on i see your buddy here rob says that he's been your biggest influencer for forever <laughs> <laughs> i've known rob from competing on stage with you guys too um someone else asked uh, what key things you look for when taking on a client i know we touched on it but um just for one last push for your, for your coaching yeah just to paraphrase it what are the key things you look for taking on a client they've got to be coachable for one like they've got to be right. you know people that come to me saying i only do this this and this we're not going to work uh, right away they're crossed off if they come and they're inquiring as to my methods i don't have a method i tell them i don't have a method it depends on what we come up with together um, so they got to be coachable and they've got to have that men athlete's mentality. Like I touched on earlier, but they can't just be a weekend warrior. Like I want to cross this off a bucket list and, and do a show. It's, they've got to be able to win. I, you know, the way social media is, there's people that they don't care about so much about the actual competition and the, the athletic endeavor and the event and the training leading up to it. It's, I can't wait to post my pictures, my progress pictures and have my hundred or 200 likes people tell me you got this and uh you know and when i don't do well people saying oh i don't know what the judges are thinking you you know they're crazy and you should have won and blah 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 i don't want those people i want the people that the process yeah. and the end the end result is just as important so they embrace the process you know they like to push they like to drive they have that mentality of i want to win or i want to i want to do well i don't want yeah. it's called bodybuilding not body stay the same <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Like that. no, that makes sense. I like that. <laughs> Very true. Very I true. like that. Jay, man, you're the best, bro. I can't thank you enough for coming on. Thanks, um, I really appreciate it. Um, is there anything that you want to, anyone you want to shout out, anyone you want to give a special thanks to? No, I'll, I'll just touch on Rob Graham's comment. Uh, <laughs> he's a good shit. We're good buddies. And, uh, you know, there's very, very few relationships that develop, true relationships that develop in this, this industry because people have egos or agendas and you know he's one of the guys that we met at a national six years ago and uh i was gonna ask that he reached out to me on on facebook and we've been tight ever since and you know he's one of those guys that i can text him at any time and it's like if we haven't talked for two weeks it's like we pick up like it was just yesterday we were, we were hanging out so 
Awesome. Well, I'll, I'll give him that. I'll give him that, that he's, he's an influence on me for sure. All right, Rob, there's your shout out. I got another question I wanted to ask, and I'm going to ask um, because I know a lot of people don't have the, you know, ability or they don't know a cop. And especially during this time of pandemic, people, and I know I would like to kind of just get your two cents briefly on um, if you've seen any, you know, fluctuation or um, change in the calls you're getting um, and kind of your whole input on that to see that because, you know, you don't hear it on the news how it's affecting people so much with mental health or if you're getting more domestic calls, substance abuse calls. Uh, they just show you that, you know, negative. People are dying. People are dying. And, right. you know, they don't show how much it's also affecting the, us, the citizens and, you know, the community, people being, you know, inside and not being able to do jack shit, basically. I, I would say, based on my experience and what I've seen when I've been on shift, um, initially the call volume went down. Um, but now it's gone back up again to where, you know, it's like nothing, nothing was ever happening, but uh, when it was down, you know, there's a lot more suicide attempts or threats, uh, domestics, uh, mental health calls, You're right? Uh, family disputes. Those are the big ones. I mean, we have a COVID team that responds to, you know, the specific COVID oh, wow. people, not people, not social distancing or know it, a yeah. large gathering or whatever, but the mental health stuff and the domestic stuff are the huge ones that we're going to because, you know, you take someone to the hospital, they don't really, you know, they're, they, there's the scare of taking you to the hospital and yeah, right. The, the main focus is on COVID. So the system's kind of, everything's been put on pause like every other ailment, right? And I would say that the, the help just isn't quite there and I would say that also the being cooped up and as I joke and say, uh, being on house arrest, government appointed right. house arrest, there's a lot of, for a lot of people, that's a lonely time. Um, it limits their social, social interaction or their uh, availability to resources and their mental health is, is, is at stake. And mm -hmm. same with substance abuse, addiction, they all go hand in hand and people that are married or, living together like family wise you're stuck right and they're yeah. spending a lot more time with each other without the outlet they'd like to yeah. than, than, than the outlets they normally have right so what do you do when you're around somebody that you even if you care about them if you're around them too much they start you get irritated right yeah for you sure. you're not used to it you poke right yeah and people fight and they can't resolve their issues or they, they don't have the means to resolve their issues and we get called all the time. So that's See, I didn't know you guys had a COVID team. And so is the COVID team responsible for just cruising around to see if people are abiding by the social distancing uh, law? So when we get, when our dispatchers get a call that's COVID related, they will um, redirect it to the COVID team and they will dispatch it out. So, you know, if, if there's a house party and, and you know, people say there's a house party, whatever, if it's not something that requires the, the road officers to go for officer safety, they'll send a COVID car with two officers, you know. Is that like the rookies? Or, they send the rookies out or something? No, no. <laughs> you guys are on COVID call. Get out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and grab coffee on the way back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. no, so like I might go in for a shift and I go, you're, you're getting assigned to the COVID team. So you go to the COVID team, you're responding to all the calls and and you're you're gonna you're gonna go to them um in terms of how it affects us as a police officer it's like you got a monkey on your back the whole time so when you yeah. go to deal with somebody or you're going to somebody's home there's there's that there's always that risk of there being a contagion there so you're always yeah. thinking about that too you're not just thinking about the call in front of you you're thinking about your health yeah and there's been times where you know i've had to react to an officer needs assistance in another division, and I ended up reacting. Didn't have time to get, you know, I barely got my hatch gloves on, but I got the guy's blood all over me, and oh my I was going to the hospital in my PPE gear, and he was playing the COVID game, and so there's that worry, like, what if this guy does have it? What if, Yeah. and now I got his blood all over me too, I don't know what else he has. It's, normally you wouldn't care so much, you know, you'd go wash up, and you'd, you'd disinfect and do whatever, but 
there's this this whole unknown, this whole COVID thing. And the same thing when you go to sudden deaths, you know, if they've performed CPR and, you know, they're relying on family members or, or witness, witnesses to uh, answer the COVID screening questions. So if, if, if they don't, if they answer one question, you know, improperly, it's, well, they didn't pass the COVID screener and they're negative, right. they're positive for COVID screening. Wow. So yeah. Now you're going in thinking, what if I can't give them? But there, doesn't the COVID yeah. wouldn't that the COVID team have to go in with like a a, a mask? So and I guess the COVID team doesn't respond to sudden deaths. The the road guys do. You can't wear a mask as a road guy. You can't fight with a mask. No, 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 no. I'm saying if it's getting do they don't wait. Do, do they make? They don't. Do they ask you guys to wear masks? Yeah, we got we've got surgical masks. I mean, we've got a pandemic kit too, which has the shield, we've got, and we have goggles that we wear, and we have. Uh, yeah, if he has to pull someone over, what's he going to do? Just go in yeah, and let I the guess. guy breathe on his face? Like, no, no, yeah, I guess. But it, you you kind of play it by ear because, like, I personally don't wear my mask or my goggles unless I think, okay, I'm going to have to. And right, you're kind of yeah. playing as you go to the call. You know, there's sometimes you get out and, you you know, you're, you're just talking with people and you're taking a report and you keep your distance from them and you don't need to do that stuff. But there's other times where you got to put your gloves on, you know, you got to got to put your pandemic kit on which is the gown the, the face mask whatever oh man it just depends, right? so that, yeah that's, that's depends on the the call i guess too yeah you know and then you know if you come in contact with somebody that you know say they go to an autopsy and they they tested positive for covid and you haven't been at that call well now you're you're notified and you're off for 14 days because what if you came in contact with they don't want you contaminating any other officers or crazy or whatever so it's there's there's a lot. It's it's not just the real world. It's within organizations that there's the unknowns, right? And it's kind of trial by error. Where they're they're doing things. And everything's changing week to week and, and shift by shift. Like I'll go in on on Friday, and there's probably going to be more changes, right? Has so, there been any COVID cases in like your good. your uh, unit or anyone of, from your region? I guess I could say like anybody on or, on staff. On, yeah, like anyone. Yeah. On the police service, we've yeah. had one confirmed case, and I think two that were sent home just in case. Well, that's Scary. a very wow. good. Yeah. That's a that's a low, you know. Yep. Yeah, um, those so are low good. numbers. And that that yeah. case is resolved. So that's good. Uh, I mean, I guess you kind of get the idea after doing it for so long. You pull someone over, you see they're kind of sketchy. You get a glimpse. <laughs> of them, you're like, I got to suit up this guy. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. He's you wait here, sir. You wait that. here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be back in a cape and a, in a you know, <laughs> bubble <bubble-bubble>. Yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 and, and the, you know, to go hands on with somebody, you're always kind of hesitant now because you're like, ugh. I know. You don't, I know. don't really want to, right? Yeah. yeah. Shit, that must change a kind of a different dynamic. And then sometimes innocent people, like innocently people would talk to me and everyone wants to explain things to you as a, as a police officer when you're there to help. I had to tell people, okay, step away. Yeah, back yeah. off for sure, for step sure. Yeah, there give me your space. On their phone, I'm like, you need to step away. I'm not going to ask you again. You, you, you know, and you kind of tell them, like, I'm not being rude. It's social distancing. You got to just, I don't know, you don't want me to just step right. back. I want to infect right, you right. if I got something. I don't yeah. want to get connected, so. Fair, very fair. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it, it has, for the most part, policing is the same. You just kind of always have that little monkey on your back that the unknown. Well, I mean, I feel like you guys always have that monkey, but now it's more like an elephant with the whole COVID thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's with us in the elephants? Every episode, they got an elephant I like somewhere. elephants. <laughs> I like elephants. <laughs> All right, Jay, man. Thanks like, again. Thank you so much. Appreciate and, um, it. We're going to tap it off because we're going to have to have you on again. Yeah, you can see okay. how well we shoot the shit. So. Cool. All right, boys. Thanks Natural dynamic. All right. Thanks, awesome. Man. Have a great day. Greener, right. meaner, greener. Meaner, Thanks, brother. Team green, greener. All right. Team All right. green physiques. Thanks. Supplements designed by an IFBB pro, holistic nutritionist, and veteran. Our 360 Quality Assurance System ensures you get fully dosed supplements that work. Whether your goal is to build muscle, burn fat, enhance strength, or extend endurance, we've got what you need. This is an army of iron warriors. This is the AG Army. Join us and wage war on your genetics. AGArmy.com Field tested, science proven, advanced genetics.